wouldn't mind grabbing your Bibles and standing. We are in John chapter 6, returning to John 6 after uh, three months of healing. Not you, but me. <laughs> John 6, 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing a great multitude coming towards them, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a small boy here, eight, nine years old, who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, or blessed, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over from those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountains by himself alone. Let's stop there and pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We know that in them you speak to us, you give us faith, you give us life. So may your word penetrate each one of our hearts and minds this day so that we're changed. When we leave this place, we'll be more like you. We ask that in Jesus' name. And all of God's children agreed by saying, Amen. Amen. You may be seated, please. Well, I know a pastor who is an avid L.A. Dodger fan, and uh, he's a season ticket holder, so he might be addicted. Uh, but he thought uh, he could take his seven-year-old son to the baseball game for the first time and get his son addicted so they could go as father and son. But the son was really kind of bored with baseball, but he found the Dodger dogs, you know, the hot dogs that they served there amazing. And uh, so his dad ordered him one, and then another, and then another, and then popcorn, and then ice cream, Coke, and just a ton of all kinds of junk food. Well, in the seventh inning, the game was a loss. Half of the crowd was gone. Most of the crowd were leaving in the seventh inning. And there was a guy just sitting a couple seats from him. And uh, he said, well, I'm surprised you're still here. What keeps you? And he said, I'm just going to stay and watch and see how much your son can really eat. Most of us like to eat. In today's passage, it's this fascinating miracle that uh, takes place around food. And uh, it's commonly called the feeding of the 5,000, which is a little bit misleading because it was more like feeding of the 8,000 or 10,000 because there were 5,000 men. It's not entirely a male chauvinist statement. It's that that's the way that uh, they counted groups, of heads of household, kind of like when we do a census in America. So there were 5,000 men. How many women and children? Your guess is as good as anyone others, but thousands of people that were there. This miracle is unusual in that it is the only miracle repeated in all four of the Gospels, which means to us that the Holy Spirit must want us to grasp what's going on. There's... Uh, 
lots of other miracles that are mentioned two and three gospels, but this is the only one that gets space in all of them. What is it that God is trying to say to us? Well, it's an account of his disciples learning about how God takes care of his people and those who follow him. It's really a testing of each one of them when they would be tempted to respond in a very physical, natural way. How are we going to feed them? And Philip says, well, you know what? There's not a McDonald's in the place. It's going to be 2,000 years before they get here. I don't know what we're going to do. And we, you and I, are being tested all the time too. Do we respond in a very pragmatic, materialistic, physical way? Or do we look for God in our problems, in our opportunities, someone called them, in our trials? So as we pass through the story, you'll notice that the disciples were not expecting anything supernatural. Are you? That's the test for all of us. See, faith is to trust that God is doing something supernatural in our lives. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to feed 5,000, but he does change things in our life in ways that we can't change them, which is the beauty of salvation. So as we track through this story, you'll see there's three sections to it. The first one is he's being pursued by a great multitude of people, first two verses. And then the problem is outlined. How do you have eight or 10,000 people over for lunch? And then uh, the provision that God provides in the last section, 11 to 15. Pretty easy to follow that outline. Let's jump in and see what God might speak to us. Verse 1, after these things, all the things that we've been studying in the first five chapters of John, but it's been so long ago that you've forgotten. I almost forgot, and I was teaching it. There was this little incident with a guy that ran a red light out here at the corner. Watch that corner. It's scary. You could be absolutely right and still be beat up pretty bad. So my pickup truck looks like a beer can on the I-10 freeway, uh, but the good news is for a couple of broken arms, they buy you a new truck. The other guy's insurance company does, but that's why we've been so long since we've been in John. So here we return. After these things, uh, the introduction in the first year of his ministry, that was the first section, uh, and now we're coming to the the section of, uh, of just his miracles going on daily. He's at the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. There it is. That's, we have a group from the church there right now, 57 people. And if you look real close, no, I'm, I'm teasing you. It's one of the most beautiful lakes in the world. That's sunrise looking to the east. And they're staying in a hotel just off to the right. And uh, today, if I have the numbers right, they are going to the Jordan River to do a baptism where John baptized Jesus. That make you jealous? <laughs> That's my intent. Uh, you all need to go to Israel. It is a, a life-changing trip. I, I was talking to a young a Jewish guy this week, uh, and I... I asked him about Israel. He, I said, have you ever been there? He said, well, just once. And he was kind of casual about it. I said, did it change you? And he looked at me for a long minute and his eyes filled with tears and he said, completely. I said, well, it affects Christians the same way. That's, he said, well, why is your church going? You guys are like Christians, right? Why would you go to Israel? Well, Jesus, oh yeah. <laughs> the most famous Jew of all, and we kept going, but anyway, you understand. So they're at uh, the Jordan River today, being baptized, heading down towards the Dead Sea, and I wish I was with them, and you do too. Verse 2, then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. Literally, it says the great multitudes were following him, because they were seeing his miracles, which he was doing for those who were sick. Continuous miracles, it's present perfect tense, so 
over and over again as they were going along. Jesus is healing people. Mark's gospel said that they were under so much pressure, the disciples and Jesus, they didn't have time to eat. They were exhausted, they were weary, uh, and uh, Jesus is going over to the other side of the lake. And um, the lesson is be careful when you're tired. Tests usually come when we're fatigued, when our attitude starts to waver a little bit. And uh, this uh, pursuit had left them in a vulnerable position. The rest of the disciples were not thinking spiritually. They were only thinking physically. The second movement is the problem. Let's discuss here starting in verse 3. Jesus went up on a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. The people saw him, and they ran around the lake, we're told in Matthew, uh, and that's the way the Sea of Galilee is. It's, it's pretty wide open, so sailboat moves slow, so they ran around. And so when Jesus and his disciples thought they were going for a rest, a vacation, they get out of the boat to 10,000 of their closest friends, people that were wanting to spend some time with them. So Jesus understood fatigue. He understood your tiredness the things that weigh you down when you become weary because he has experienced all those things he understands. Verse 4 says it was Passover time, the feast of the Jews. Now, you've got to recalibrate your thinking for when this was written. This was written at least 50 years after Jesus had risen from the dead. We believe that John was the youngest disciple, apostle, and um, tradition says that he went to Ephesus, the city that the book, the Ephesians, is written to. But it was there that he wrote the gospel. And he's 90 years old, and it's about the year 90. So he has had a lot of time to think through, but he's among Gentiles. He, he's among citizens of the Roman Empire. Very few Jews there at the time. And so he's wanting them to understand that uh, this is a Jewish feast day. They didn't understand it. They had no idea. The Passover was just three weeks ago. It's usually about Easter time. And so uh, it's this time of year that they were there sitting on the side of this mountain. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing this great multitude coming towards him, he turned to Philip, where shall we buy bread that there these may eat? Matthew 14 says that Jesus began to speak to them about the kingdom of God. And after he taught a while, evidently, he is uh, looking at the needs, looks at the time of the day, the sun, no watch. And uh, he said... Uh, to Philip, who we understand came from Bethsaida, which is where this takes place on this, a hill. And uh, he's trying to get his disciples involved in the miracle. He knows he's about ready to do something spectacular. This is a spectacular miracle. They all are. But this one especially because he is creating things in a new way. Uh, it, it's a little bit like the miracle that we read when he turned water to wine, that he took an inorganic liquid water and turned it into an organic one, wine which has 450 minimum constituents in it of, of acids and tannins and uh, all the things that affect taste. And they weren't there before. He didn't touch it. They just poured the water and he said, go give it to the steward. How did he do that? I don't know. He doesn't tell us. And sometimes scripture is as frustrating in what it says as what it doesn't say. And this is going to be one of those miracles. Where are we going to get some food? Philip's from the area and he says, no chance, no Del Tacos. What are we going to do? He, he's testing him, Jesus says, verse 6. But this he said to test him. For he himself knew what he was about to do. The Heavenly Father had directed him. So 
uh, sometimes our difficulties are God's pop quizzes. You know, I used to hate those in school. I hated them when I taught at, at college. The, um, the students aren't prepared, but the idea is to see how much they've been getting just by lecturing. So Jesus has been teaching, he's been doing miracles, and this is a test for Philip. Now, Philip uh, had an analytical mind. He's a pragmatist, which is part of my problem. F faith doesn't come easily to someone who is, has this, like a science background, or even a mechanic, or somebody that is uh, you know, very practical as they work through things. Uh, he's a pragmatist. And he liked things that made sense, things that worked. Uh, pragmatists are also usually control freaks. I won't ask for a show of, ha show of hands, but it's difficult to be a disciple of Jesus when you want to control everything around you. Don't ask me how I know that. Um, the world calls it be reasonable. And rather than expecting God to do something supernatural, you look for something from the physical world, according to the laws of nature, of chance, how things happen. So Philip answered Jesus' question, where are we going to get food around here? He said, 200 denarii, this is about a six or seven month uh, wage in that day. You couldn't buy enough with, with six months of wages, he said. It's not sufficient for them that everyone could even have just a little tiny bit. A common labor um, earned one denarius a day. So fast food is 2,000 years away. They're about ready to see fast food in the first century here. Um, examine yourselves, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13.5 as to see whether you are in the faith. Am I trusting God? Examine yourself. Or, or am I trusting in what I know, what I'm able to do? Um, I've let myself down enough times in life. I, I, I'm less tempted to trust me, and uh, I'm trying to trust him. But we be, we're being tested all the time. Way back in 1933, just outside of San Diego, if you know the area and go uh, what would be east on the 8 freeway, um, there is a Goat Canyon Boulevard about uh, 12 miles east towards Yuma. And if you take that off, and it's an interesting place to stop, uh, there the Arizona uh, Railway was building that bridge. It is the longest wooden bridge ever built in the world. 700 and almost 50 feet long, 746 feet long, and over 400 feet high at the middle. And when they had finished constructing it, the supervisor asked the engineer of the train that had carried all those great timbers there to load up the train with a weight on the flat cars of rocks and sand and gravel in that area that was twice the amount he expected the train to carry. And then he asked him to take it out on the trestle. And the engineer stopped, he said, what are you, you trying to break this bridge? He said, no, no, I want you to test it. I want you to be confident that even if you overload the train, I've built this thing strong. Well, that's a little bit in this world, in, in this word testing here that's going on in Philip's life that God won't let him down. That doesn't mean God always does what Philip wants him to do. God doesn't always do what I want him to do. But that means that in the final analysis, when everything is said and done, God is good all the time. Even though, amen. And even though you may not grasp it at the moment, when you look back from eternity, you look at every one of those institutes, every incident in your life and say, oh, that was God's hand. He was strengthening me. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here with two broken arms and six broken ribs and a banged up knee and going, thanks Lord, that was great, I needed that. 
just so you know, I struggle like everybody else. Verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, this is Simon Peter's brother, we're told, speaks to him. Um, Peter's going to take up this pop, or uh, Andrew's going to take up this pop quiz. And uh, he too, like Philip, was from Bethsaida, so he knows the area. And uh, he is the one who, when he met Jesus, the first thing he did was went back and got his brother Peter. So he brings people to Jesus. Jesus said, we're told in the Gospel of Mark, go out and see how much food there is. And so the disciples evidently go around. It had to take a while to get to 5,000 people. This church fits 2,500, so twice as many people as there are seats in this place. Hey, you have any food? <laughs> and, uh, and he comes back. There is a lad, and the word is double diminutive, meaning he's very small. He's seven or eight years old. Here, who has five barley loaves and two small fish. Now, you read some commentators about this, and it sounds like he brought five Italian loaves and two yellow fin tunas, 40 pounds apiece. No, no, the, these are still today about the size of an English muffin, okay? So he's got five English muffins and two sardines that do grow in the Sea of Galilee. So the theologians love to go on and on and say, well, when the kid said that he had this, all the adults started feeling sorry and, and guilty that they had, and they reached in their sleeves and they took out their lunch. That's why there was so much fish and bread. In theology, that's called baloney. Okay. <laughs> So, barley loaves. Barley was a poor man's grain. The family that this young lad came from uh, didn't have much money. It's the coarsest, roughest food. They still feed it to uh, cattle. And uh, there's a lesson here. God doesn't require very much from you and I. Um, scripture is filled with that. He only wants us to use what we have available to us. This kid's, that's all he's got. I don't know how it came down at home. Probably he had a, I, I grew up with a large family, and five kids, three boys, Irish Catholic family. And my mom would check us all when we left, check our ears, check our teeth, make sure we brush our teeth, and, and then pack us up a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and send us down the road in a brown paper sack to school or something. So that's probably what happened. And so she checks them all out and he says, where's your lunch? I don't have one. And so she throws one together of what she had. And uh, the key is availability here. And that's a part of the lesson here for you and I. Scripture is filled with men and women like um, Gideon and Deborah and Elijah and Ruth and Esther who only had what was available to them, but they gave it to the Lord, and the God used it to change people around them and to change them. He doesn't require personal fortunes. He doesn't require elevated degrees, graduate degrees. He doesn't require knowing the right people or being born in a family with the right last name. All he requires is that we use what we have. George Mueller in England was a, a famous... Uh, founder of orphanages in the 1800s. It's a great story. He founded 117 orphanages and uh, he educated more than 120,000 children without him looking for any funds. No radio advertisements, no TV advertisements. He just prayed that God would bring it in. There's a very famous story of one of the largest uh, orphanages in Bristol, England. They had run out of milk, and they didn't know what to do because the next morning the kids all ate porridge, and uh, this famous story is they, he had the whole staff get on their knees, and they all prayed that God would bring some milk. And as they finished praying, somebody knocked on the front door. Mueller opened the front door, and there stands a milkman. And he said, well, that was quick. He said, what do you mean? He said, oh, well, we were just praying about needing milk. He said, well, I got a broken down milk cart. This is the 1800s. There's no refrigeration. So he's got this milk cart filled with milk with a broken wheel. 
And he said, it's all going to spoil. Do you think the kids could use some milk? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's using what's available. And sometimes you pray to ask God. Mueller would later write, God's work, God's way, brings God's provision. When you're doing God's work, and you do it in the way that he would want you to, then God will provide. We're sitting in a church that was built with that principle. We were trying to buy this property. We're in the old building, the old packing house up on the corner. And uh, the guy that owned this property wanted a certain amount of money, and we, we made an offer. But we didn't know that there was a woman who was bidding against us, and she paid him almost twice what we offered, which we didn't have. And she bought it, and uh, we were disappointed because we had prayed and walked around this property and asked God to give it. And, uh, and this woman then contacted me and said, uh, I'll sell you that property for, the number was three times what she paid for. She didn't know I knew what she paid for. it. I said, ma'am, we'd love to have the property, but we can't afford it. Well, it, it took about five years but after about four and a half years, she was going to put a lock and store here. <laughs> you would have been sitting amongst RVs and uh, your garage was too full, so you brought your stuff here. Actually, some of that is going on right now. Um, we have, anyway. Stop. Focus, focus, back on. So uh, about four and a half years later, uh, I see in the paper that the lady's been arrested who owns the property. And uh, she was arrested for land fraud, changing titles. And uh, I didn't know what that meant ultimately, but it was uh, only about three or four weeks later, I got a telephone call from a, a developer in Orange County. And he said, uh, I was at a tax lien sale, and uh, I bought the property right next door to you. And he said, I really didn't need the property. It was just such a good deal uh, that when I got it, I got all the paperwork with it. And I see here that you had made an offer for the property five years earlier. And I said, well, yes, sir, that, that's true. He said, would you like to buy it for 10 cents on the dollar? One-tenth of what we had offered for this property, God said, I'm, I'm giving it to you. And so when we built this building right here, three foot in front of me, we buried a Bible. Not because that Bible is any different than any other one you could get in the bookstore, but we wanted anything that happened in this building to be based on the Bible. God's work. God's way. By the way, you can pray for the corner down there. We haven't... <laughs> gotten that one yet but we think God wants us to have it so yes Lord we'll say yes can we have it for 10 cents on the dollar come on <laughs> verse 10 then Jesus said make the people sit down there was much grass in the place why well because it's springtime in Israel and there's the place where they fed the 5,000 according to tradition Look up and you'll see the Sea of Galilee off to the center and the right, and uh, Moab at the left, and this is uh, the traditional mount of the feeding of 5,000. And our team was there on Tuesday, and they sat down and uh, had lunch, I heard, but they didn't get near as much food as these people are about to get. Um, grassy knoll, winter rains, uh, red poppies all over the ground. It's just absolutely stunningly beautiful. 5,000. So the men sat down. Uh, the anthropos is the Greek word, which could be men and women, of course. And uh, there's a lot of people there. Jesus took the loaves that this kid had given, and he blessed them. He gave thanks he said, we would call it grace. If God the Son thinks it's a good idea to pray when you receive 
breakfast, lunch, or dinner, then it must be a good thing. If you don't pray regularly at home, uh, let me talk to the dads or the moms that are leaving the home. This is the easy opportunity to begin prayer in your home. And it doesn't have to be King James English. You know, uh, uh, rub-a-dub-dub, thank God for the grub, amen. That, that'll work. God's just glad that you're recognizing him. But there's something unique about this prayer. It is not blessing the food. It is blessing the giver. He blessed, took the loaves, and when he had given thanks to God, the traditional Jewish prayer is, Baruch HaAdonai, Elohim Mehlek Zohar Hadar Inamino, Hadakim Adamor. I practiced that all week. I don't want you to think I, pre- I speak e- Hebrew that well. Blessed are you, Lord, the King of heaven, who brings forth bread from the earth. Cool prayer. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's giving thanks and he's blessing Father God. They sat down and then he began to have the disciples distribute. And this is a key to the story. You are a distributor. You are not a producer of spiritual things. We can't manufacture spiritual things, but we can distribute what God has put in our hands. And that's the story of his disciples. They're in training. You and I are in training. Nobody arrives here on planet Earth. And their training is to touch what Jesus touched and give it away. And when they give it away, he multiplies it. And this is a fascinating miracle to me from a scientific point of view. It just drives me crazy because it doesn't say. Is it like a Star Trek replicator? Those of you that you know, watch that movie, the movies or the, the TV series, where they push a button and you know, hot coffee appears in a cup or something like that. Jesus takes the bread and as he breaks it, new atoms appear. What? It doesn't tell us how, but suddenly the bread that was here is split in half and now there's the same amount over here. And he puts it in a basket. Now follow me a minute. This is bread made from wheat that had never grown. These are fish that had never swam. I heard your brain slide to a stop. (laughs) Because that doesn't compute. That doesn't make sense. I'm a pragmatist. Sure, it says it's fish. They must have been fish somewhere. Did they jump out of the sea and wiggle their way up the side of the mountain? No, as he broke them, where did the atoms come from? He's the creator. He created the heavens and the earth, the cosmos. Oh, you're one of those that actually believes God created out of nothing. Yeah. We're kind of stuck with that. That's the way scripture says it. So he blesses it, and there's all this food that had never existed before. And when they were filled, (laughs) love the word, it's literally glutted. When They were glutted. This is what you and I feel like after we've had Thanksgiving dinner and a second round of mashed potatoes and turkey and all the things. And at the Ray House, we have a tradition of laying on the carpet because we're so full we can't breathe. And then my wife, Ray Lynn, walks around and says, who wants some pumpkin pie? And we're groaning. But I hear my mouth say, I'll take a piece. (laughs) So they're glutted. They're full of, to overflowing. Jesus says, go, ba- go out and gather up all the fragments so that nothing is wasted. This is a very Jewish tradition. If you have a meal in a Jewish home, they will always save all the leftovers. Anything larger than an olive is the Dru- Jewish tradition from a meal is saved. So again, uh, don't waste anything. He wants all 12 disciples to see what he did. It was happening almost sleight of hand. Now they're going to have to gather it up and he gets 
they get 12 baskets. What a coincidence. So how did he work that out? Well, he knew that George over there would eat three pieces of fish, and his brother, the heavyweight one, would eat 40 pieces. And so he made enough for them to have just enough left over to fill a basket so that when Mark and Luke and, and John walk around, not Luke, excuse me, uh, James and John and Peter and Andrew walk around, they're carrying back something new. This is more than we started with. That's always what God does. We end up with more than we started with when we're wise enough to surrender our life to him and to love him. We are not manufacturers. We are only distributors. Therefore, 13, they gathered them up, filled 12 baskets. Uh, the Greek word kofanios uh, literally means a large wicker basket. The little boy had a basket, but that basket was small, like the size of a woman's purse. These are wicker baskets full of food and uh, left over from the five barley loaves and those by those who were eaten. His box was small, but he gave what he had, and God used it. Then those men... When they had seen the sign, all the multitude, 5,000 men who were there, that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet. There's a definite article there. Moses said that after him would come the prophet from God, meaning the Messiah. And so these men are recognized that, that this is the prophet who has come into the world from God in heaven. This is the Messiah. Jesus is him. Deuteronomy 18, 13 is, uh, 15 is the, predict, uh, the uh, prediction of that. So this is the Messiah, they say. Therefore, when Jesus perceived they were about to come and make him king, Melech, make him the Messiah, the ruler, they, they were looking for a ruler who would be a military ruler to throw the Romans out of their occupied country. He departed again to the mountain by himself because he knew that that wasn't God's way for him to lead a banner on horses of men who were fighting the Romans. Ah. So we're thinking, what is in our box? What do we have to give to the Lord? A lot, because he gives everything we have that's good came from his hand. We often forget that, don't we? There's at least two parts missing from this story. Uh, the mother, she gave what she had to her son, faithfully feeding him, taking care of him. She fed more than 5,000 people then, and she is feeding us 2,000 years later. So don't say, I'm just a mom. I'm washing laundry and I'm making lunches for my kids. You don't know how that might be spread around the world. The second part of the story that it doesn't tell us what happened, but let me speculate just a little bit. This young boy, seven or eight years old, grew to be a man. He remembers that day like it happened today. He remembers everything as he sat on a rock and watched Jesus take his English muffin and break it and then break that and break that and break that and break that and fill up these baskets. And his mouth is hanging over and he doesn't blink. He's absolutely caught off guard by what happened with his lunch. And then the same thing again with the fish. When he became a man, and he married and had children, at night as he put his children to bed, he would pray with them. And then the kids would say, Dad, tell us about Jesus again. What was he like? What did his face look like? 
when he was breaking the bread. Oh, he was laughing out loud, son. He was having more fun than you can imagine. Well, well, does he love us like he loved you? Well, of course he does. Does he take care of us like you've taken care of us? He's your heavenly father. And the next night when he puts them to bed, the kids say again, Dad, tell us about Jesus again. And he starts through it again. Dads, moms, the world is trying to steal your children's hearts. You know what's going on in the news. I don't have to repeat it. But if you will love the Lord God with your heart, with your soul, with your mind, and with your strength, your children will see you living it out. And they will never doubt the existence of Jesus. And they will follow you into the next generation. And then your grandchildren will say, Grandpa, tell me about Jesus. It's happened to me. I've seen it happen with my grandchildren. Tell us what happened when you did this. What did God do? And God will be faithful for your generation, the next generation, your children's children's children. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Now, you know, I like to usually end a sermon with a, a little story. It's a little bit different this morning. I want to show you a video. And of all things, it's a video of a rodeo in Texas, Belton, Texas, on March 1st, last month. And it tells the story. Drama at the rodeo as a cowboy is thrown off a bull right out of the gate. Now watch as wranglers try to divert the bucking beast. A man jumps into the arena and throws his body onto the unconscious cowboy. The bull lowers his horns and charges. But that's not just any spectator, it's the bull rider's father. 18-year-old Cody Hooks shared the video writing, big thanks to my dad, could have been a hell of a lot worse. And here are father and son today. He uh, covered my head up and you know, kept my head from any more injuries. Did your dad save your life? Yes, ma'am, he did. Now his dad is being called Father of the Year. What do you think about all of this attention? I would do anything to save any of my children. It wouldn't matter what it is. <laughs> That's a picture of your heavenly father sending Jesus to protect you. I don't know if you clearly saw what was going on. It's a little muddy, and, but this 18-year-old kid is bull riding. He gets thrown off. And a spectator, they said, ran out and covered him. I wasn't any spectator. It was his father. And his father didn't think twice about it. Just like your heavenly father doesn't think twice about protecting you. Would you stand please and we'll pray together. Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus who died in our place. The great exchange. His life for ours. We thank you, Lord. How will we be able to thank you down through eternity completely? But we see your hand even in this place. We sense your presence and your touch. And Lord, we pray for anyone here who is not walking with you, that you would give them grace to surrender their lives to you and confess their sins and receive salvation. Christians, please pray. So I wonder if there's someone here this morning that God is speaking to about your own life. Maybe you have given your heart to the Lord before in the past and now you've wandered from the past. Or maybe you've never surrendered to him and asked him to forgive your sin. This moment is for you. We wouldn't do anything to embarrass you. But if you would like to know that your sins are forgiven, if you'd like to know that you're going to spend eternity with God, 
If you're ready to surrender your life to God, would you let me know you're ready by lifting your hand? And I'll take that to mean, God bless you, that God is working in your heart. One, two, three, four, four, five of you. God bless you in the back row. Six. Anyone over here God is speaking to? Back row. God bless you. If I miss your hand, don't worry. God didn't. He's moving in this place. Those of you that raised your hands, would you please pray along with all of us? We're going to say it out loud, make it easy for you. So would everybody please say, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive my sins. In Jesus' name. Amen.